I think we can start. Good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you for being here today for this uh, IMA seminar. It's a real pleasure for me to introduce Simone uh, that um, will give us uh, a couple of seminars actually on uh, uh, data analysis and I would say data healing, uh, mostly dedicated to proteomics data. Uh, let me say a few words about Simone, who's, uh, who got his uh, degree from the University of Parma. Then uh, he moved uh, to Denmark for his uh, PhD. And uh, now, actually since 2019, if I remember right, he started his uh, own lab at uh, Albert Einstein uh, uh, College of Medicine in New York. Uh, um, I mean, I guess he will, he will uh, also tell uh, us about his uh, uh, research uh, topics, uh, but um, um, I can tell you that uh, Simone is uh, uh, highly involved in the um, research field that deals with uh, the biology of chromatin and the role that uh, chromatin, chromatin uh, uh, dynamics also has uh, in uh, a number of uh, uh, biological condition. So thank you very much, uh, Simone, for this uh, opportunity. We will, we are very excited, and we will gladly listen to your talk. Uh, I actually, Simone is very keen on having interactive discussion. So in case you've got uh, questions for him, feel free to interrupt him and ask your question. There's also the opportunity to ask a question through the chat that is somewhere here in Zoom. Now I don't see what it is, but I will find it. Um, and that's it. So the floor is yours now. Uh, Simone, I'll give you the host so you can start your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea, for the invitation. Thank you, everyone. And uh, of course, uh, thank you, IMAS, to carry on this uh, very interesting seminar. And uh, yeah, I will go uh, straight to the point. I'll, um, I have to admit that uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about my own research, if not at all. But uh, I think uh, um, I would like to use this um, half an hour with you, 40 minutes, um, to, to show you something that, in my experience, um, it has been something particularly interesting for those of you who are not uh, as familiar with proteomic data processing, right? So you, uh, those of you who don't do proteomic yourself, uh, you rely on uh, uh, collaborations, not only to analyze your samples, but also to the whole downstream part, you know, what happens once you have a table of proteins in an Excel format or a spreadsheet in general. And um, uh, in this um, couple of uh, sessions, uh, I would like to show you that uh, you can actually dig out from this spreadsheet um, uh, something very meaningful in, uh, you know, without having any particular skills in coding, like I don't have any, uh, everything will be done in Excel and with freely available software online. So let me start the presenter mode. Uh, I'm gonna give you uh, just a few slides of introduction, and, and then I really want to do this um, uh, very interactive, so I'm going to go back and forth between uh, an Excel table and, uh, and tools that are available online that you can just, you know, uh, connect with the, uh, with the web browser. So um, this is the agenda of uh, what we're going to discuss in this uh, two session. Uh, I must was kind enough to give me uh, two classes. Um, today, uh, we will focus about um, uh, how you transform a raw proteomic table. So how you take um, you know, an Excel table where there is a protein list and protein quantifications and how you extract you know, enriched uh, regulated proteins. Uh, and then we will have another webinar next week that once we have this uh, list of uh, enriched proteins, uh, how do you convert this list into biological meaning? Of course, you know, everything is going to be, uh, I would say, rather superficial. You know, we're not going to go into very uh, sophisticated calculations, but um, uh, I think it is going to be interesting enough uh, to get you familiar with the, with the process. Um, so I just have a, 
I just have, let's say, five introductory slides before we switch to Excel. And uh, um, just as a reminder for everyone, you know, for, for those of you not too familiar with proteomics, you know, this is the uh, typical workflow, even though proteomics comes in lots of flavors, but uh, let's say the typical workflow is that we extract proteins from nearly anything. Uh, I've seen proteomic uh, proteins extracted from uh, all kinds of uh, tissues, samples, and fluid. Uh, and then the, the classical protocol is that proteins are digested into peptides. And then peptides are easier to analyze than intact proteins. So those are the ones that are usually uh, analyzed by liquid chromatography coupled online with mass spectrometry. Uh, I have to say that now in 2021, uh, there are several companies emerging that can do very interesting proteomics without mass spectrometry, with alternative techniques. So this uh, slide might be updated soon, but um, as of today, this is still the, the most uh, utilized uh, method. Uh, and then I think like most of you who are connected today, you're not that much interested about how you run proteins into, into an instrument, but rather how you go from here uh, to this part. You know, so how do I convert the results that come out of this instrument into, uh, you know, into meaningful biology? So can I uh, organize my data into networks? Can I see if there are some enriched functions? How do I apply statistics you know, to see what are my significantly regulated features? Uh, and that's what I want to uh, discuss with you today and next week. So <clears throat> we start from here, and uh, this is what we are going to play with uh, today, literally. We are going to focus on just a comparison between two samples. I know that many of you might have uh, uh, multiple conditions. Uh, I know that, you know, it will be very interesting to talk about that too. Uh, unfortunately, you know, in 30 minutes, it might be too uh, squeezed. So we're going to focus on uh, how do you compare, you know, two sets of uh, uh, samples? And uh, allow me just uh, 10 seconds of uh, self-promotion. Uh, everything I'm going to tell you today uh, is actually enclosed in this uh, publication here uh, that, you know, last year we decided to just uh, write up because, um, in, you know, being also the director of the proteomic core, uh, these were questions that were coming up over and over again for people that were interested in looking at their data and not, you know, particularly in how you um, run your samples into the instrument. They just wanted to know, how do I convert my table into meaningful biology? So we try in this publication to explain step by step, how do we go from a row table into data transformation, normalization, and so on, until we actually extract our significant features. And that's what I'm going to uh, discuss with you today. A uh, couple more slides of uh, theory. Um, this is the first thing uh, we're going to do. <clears throat> we're going to take our raw proteomic table as it comes out from uh, uh, any proteomic software, which could be MaxQuant, MS Fragger, Proton Discoverer. You know, I apologize that I don't have time to list them all. There are many, many. Uh, your uh, uh, protein abundances, uh, when you get them out of your you know, results from, uh, from the search, are going to be uh, distributed like this. So there's going to be a few proteins in your data set that are very, very abundant. And then the vast majority of your proteins will be in the low abundance range. This is what is called the log skewed positive, uh, log positive skewed distribution. Uh, it's perfectly normal in biology. Uh, you will see exactly the same distribution if you're working with uh, RNAs, if you're working with metabolite. Uh, you know, that's just how nature works. And um, uh, basically, because these data are log skewed, uh, the exponent of those values are normally distributed. So we are going to work with data that are log transformed uh, because the log transformed data, they allow you to uh, you will see uh, mathematically it's going to be much easier to find the center of the distribution for, uh, for normalization, for imputation, for everything I'm going to tell you. And, uh, and just a couple of words about uh, normalization. <clears throat> normalization is, you know, is done with any uh, experiment, honestly, uh, even those that are not omics. Uh, and uh, the importance of the normalization is to basically minimize bias that come from the sample preparation procedure, right? So as you can see, uh, so these are data that have been log transformed. So they have a normal distribution because they are centered around the middle value. 
Uh, but you see that they are not normalized. Like so, these are uh, uh, these are presumed, for example, this is a set of samples where um, samples were not mixed in equal amount, so they are not aligned around the zero, no, no regulation, and uh, and because of this, before you compare. Uh, between data sets, you need to scale and normalize the data uh, so that the, the you know the the, the fault changes that you are going to calculate are going to be you know directly related to the how much your protein is changing your biological system and not just due to you know pipetting mistakes. Uh, in some occasions, uh, normalization is not only based on uh, centering the distribution; it's also based on adjusting the width of the distribution. Uh, we're not going to talk about that today, but just to let you know that you know, this might also be necessary at some point. Uh, this is necessary, you, know, you see, for example, when you want to normalize this data set with this one, uh, this might be necessary, for example, if your two analyses, they have different dynamic ranges for some sort of reason. Right? So you see, like, if you look at this data set, for some reason, the most regulated proteins and the least regulated proteins, they have a smaller distance compared to instead this experiment here. So, uh, you know, this, uh, this uh, compacted dynamic range uh, might be the result of your quantification method, might be the result to issues in sensitivity of the instrument. Usually when you run samples side by side with the same method, you don't have that problem. So we are going to uh, ignore this for now. And we're going to discuss only about this normalization part. And then finally, <clears throat> something I don't like to do, but is, um, uh, is necessary uh, often, is the imputation part. So we're going to talk briefly also about uh, how do you deal uh, when you have a table uh, where you have missing values. Right? So, and this is actually uh, really important to discuss for each omics because a missing value from, from a sequencing experiment does not necessarily mean the same thing as the missing value from, from a mass spectrometry experiment. And so I'm going to tell you how we do uh, data imputation. And data imputation basically simply means uh, replacing blank cells with uh, values that sort of represent what that pro protein value might be. Uh, you know, obviously, making up value is never, you know, there's not the perfect way of doing it because, uh, you know, we're just focusing on which one is the least wrong. Uh, what we are going to do, uh, we are going basically to replace uh, missing values with values that represent the, uh, the limit of detection of your experiment. Uh, we're not just going to take the minimum value uh, detectable as a representative of limit of detection, because the problem of using a fixed value is that you introduce an artificial, artificially low variability across replicates. So instead of taking a fixed volume, uh, you know, and use that, you know, to calculate our uh, uh, our statistics, we're going to take random sampled sampled values that represent the background noise, and you know, we're going to do everything in, in Excel. Right, and uh, finally, uh, and we get back, we'll get back to this slide as I show you things in practical. <clears throat> Once your data are ready, then you need to apply the proper statistical test to see not only what is most enriched, but also what is most consistently enriched, right? So the, the full change gives you, you know, the, the enrichment value and the, and the p-value that you calculate with the statistical test tells you how reproducible is by observation. So depending how your data are distributed, depending how your uh, replicates are connected to each other, we might need to use different type of tests. And each of these tests are just, is going to be just a single formula uh, in Excel. So I think that's it for my theory. OK, uh, let me put this aside for a second. And now I really want to use this opportunity with you to show you literally uh, how we do this. Um, and I'm going to go a little bit fast because anyway, this recording will be on YouTube. So uh, you're going to be able to you know, stop and come back in case something is a bit unclear. I apologize for the, uh, for the speed. Uh, so uh, this is typically how a proteomic table comes to you when uh, an analysis is finished. Of course, there are many extra columns that tell you number of peptide sequence coverage. You know, these are not important at the moment. We have uh, two conditions, uh, each of them has uh, three replicates. And then uh, basically, now the question is, 
which proteins are interesting in this table and uh, how do I convert this table into something that is, you know, uh, uh, meaningful. So uh, the way to proceed, <clears throat> we're going to do exactly what I told you until now. We're going to uh, transform our data in logarithm. Uh, we're going to use um, uh, log2. Uh, it can be any other log base. It doesn't really matter. Uh, whatever is uh, uh, more convenient for you. Uh, we like uh, log2 because uh, it gives a higher spread uh, between the lowest and the highest value. So it's easier to, uh, to show, to represent full changes when the full changes are not very big. Um, after the uh, log transformation, we're going to normalize the data. And then before we apply statistics, remember the issue that there are going to be some proteins that have um, uh, missing values in some of the replicates. We are going to impute uh, the missing values. Uh, just, to, just to show you here, if you go down, down in your table, you see that it happens that uh, there are proteins where you know, they are not detected all the time. Uh, you know, in particular, for proteins that maybe are detected only in one condition and not the other, how do you estimate an enrichment if you have uh, one series of values that are all missing, right? So that's why uh, we decide to do uh, data imputation. So uh, one last thing, <clears throat> you probably want to have an extra column uh, with uh, uh, listed the gene name uh, of your proteins. Now, uh, depending on which database was used to, to perform database search, your uh, your Protein description might look a little bit different, but you know the whole point is uh, whatever it is, you know somewhere in the description uh, there is also your gene name, right? So in uh, these are data from a uh, Uniprot. Uniprot has this format, and then uh, uh, the gene name is basically after this GN equal symbol. So what we're going to do now, <clears throat> we're going to create an extra column here. And then we're going to create a column where we specifically isolate the gene name. So the gene name, as you can see, uh, is preceded by this GN equal symbol and is followed by a space. So to uh, isolate this uh, piece of text from the cell, you just go to find and replace, and then you replace uh, space gene, gene name equal. And then you want to also replace everything that comes before this part of the text, which is expressed with the asterisk symbol, and you replace it with nothing, right? Just click replace all. Uh, it's going to isolate the gene name and everything that comes after. So now we remove space and everything that comes after the space. And here we have our gene name by itself. Right. And then, uh, you know, if you want to clean up a little bit this, you want to remove all the text that comes after the protein description. Same thing. After the protein name, it comes the organism. So space O S equal asterisk. And then you remove everything that comes after the uh, protein description. Right. So this is a table that is a little bit more comprehensible uh, because the accession numbers are, you know, they don't tell you much about which protein this is. But the gene names, you know, everybody recognizes them. Right, so let's proceed in practice. So uh, like, like I told you, now we're going to uh, transform our data in logarithm because um, raw proteomic data, actually raw any kind of omic data, uh, they have this distribution that has this positive log skew, right? So, uh, and if you don't, you don't have to believe me, you can actually plot this yourself. You can just um, uh, copy those columns and then paste them in any software that plots nice violin plots and you can use your favorite uh, my favorite is this one here this uh, shiny app that is developed by uh, the tires and uh, rap silver lab that you find online it's just called box plot r and then uh, what i do i just paste my data which are tab separated because they are an excel table <clears throat> and then i visualize this as a violin plot so you see, uh, what you see is that your most of your protein values are concentrated in the low abundance range, and then you have a few protein values that are very, very abundant. Uh, this is exactly what we expected. And you see, when you look between violin plots, you see that they are not all like equally large. Uh, that means that these data are probably going to need uh, some normalization. We'll get there in a second. So the first thing we do, uh, we transform data in logarithm. So in uh, Excel is equal log. You choose what number you want to transform, and then you choose the base. Like I said, we're going to do log two here. Uh, you can choose another base. It doesn't really matter. 
the other thing is um, the blank cells are going to give you errors, right? So because uh, you know you cannot make the logarithm of a blank cell. So in front of this formula, I'm going to write if all of this gives me an error, I'm going to leave the cell blank. Uh, two quotes with nothing in between means an empty cell in Excel because the quote delineates a text instead of formulas in Excel. So if instead of nothing, I would have written Simone, uh, then instead of a blank cell, there would be a cell with written Simone. Uh, two quotes with nothing in between is just a blank cell. So now all of your values are log transformed. So what we have here, we have uh, new data that instead of being uh, log skewed distributed, now they are normally distributed. So let me show you here. I'm going to plot, oops, sorry. The computer slowed down for some reason. Yeah, of course, it had to give problems now. <sighs> sorry about that. Anyway, uh, as this one clears up, uh, let me actually proceed uh, with the next step. Like I told you, the next step is going to be the normalization, right? And now because your data, they have um, a normal distribution, uh, to normalize data, uh, all we have to do is basically center your data around you know, a central value. Right, so uh, now let's assume that these data they have the same, uh, you know, distribution width. Right, so we're just going to compare these two uh, sets of values. Now, in order to normalize them, what we need to do, we just need to subtract the center of their distribution. So in this way, they will align. And if the center of the distribution for normal distributed data is nothing else than the average or the median. When you have thousands of values, the average or the median is basically the same value. Uh, and in fact, you see that when you subtract the, the center of the distribution, uh, you will have some values that are above zero. So they are above the average of the distribution and some values that are below zero, that are below the average. So in the end, uh, you will have a, a series of normalized conditions that are centered around zero. Now let's see if this problem is solved. Of course not. Ah. I knew it. I was going to have problems today. Okay, sorry. Let me just uh, <clears throat> let me just open this again. I don't know why. Apologize for that. Right. Yeah. Something had to happen. Doesn't matter. Uh, you you can trust me for now. Uh, let me proceed with that. So, how do we normalize the data? Uh, like I said, we just need to uh, subtract the average from uh, the data distribution. And you know these are log transform data. So in reality, what we are doing, we are actually dividing values, right? So if you remember, uh, we, learned, we remember we learned this in high school, and then we forget. You know the log of a divided by b is equal to log a minus log b. So now we are subtracting value. In reality, what we are doing, we are dividing by the uh, by the average. So uh, basically, the formula is just simply this: is just uh, each value is to each value we subtract the average of the column. So this is the value that has been normalized. And again, there's going to be some blank cells here that are going to give you an error. So here, to avoid errors, I'm going to write that if this cell is equal to blank, I'm going to leave it blank for the moment. Otherwise, I'm going to apply my formula uh, where each value, to each value we subtract uh, the average of the column, right? So what you have now here, uh, these are normalized data. And, and I wish I could, I just give it the last try. If not, okay, sorry, finally. Yeah, so let me just do one last try. So like I said, before normalization, your data that are uh, log transformed are going to be uh, normally uh, distributed. And in fact, if you visualize this as a violin plot, you see that now, you know, of course, the, no, the distribution is not perfect, but you see that now they have, uh, you know, this valley uh, where your data are most concentrated that is more or less uh, the symmetry of your data. And then, as you can see, this sample is called RMDs. 
for some reason you, you have worked with a little bit less material. So now if you calculate the fault change between this condition and this condition, everything is going to look like upregulated in the white type, even proteins that are in reality not changing just because you injected less in your RMD sample. That's why we do the normalization part. So after your data are normalized, after we subtract the center of the distribution, your data now are going to look perfectly aligned. And you see they are aligned around the zero value. It means that there are values that are more abundant than the average, values that are less abundant than the average. Now that they are aligned, we can perform uh, you know, fold changes. We just have one last thing to do. Uh, we have to replace the missing values with values that are uh, representative of uh, background noise. So same thing, we use a logical formula in Excel. And then we say that if this cell is equal to blank, then we're gonna replace it with you know, this imputed value. Now you remember <clears throat> what we discussed here, right? So imputed values are values that are going to be representative of the background noise. So they are in this last percentage of, you know, of your Gaussian distribution, right? And um, as you remember, you know, the Gaussian distribution has some specific properties, one of which is that two standard deviations represent about 95% of the area of your Gaussian distribution, which means if we go two standard deviations to the left of your uh, Gaussian distribution, we are in this 2.5%, you know, limit of detection range. And that's a good, you know, that's a good ballpark area where to impute missing values. So what we're going to do, again, we're gonna say if this cell is equal to blank, then we're gonna move left of two standard deviations. So the standard deviation of the column times two, uh, and then we have to impute some random values. Uh, how do we impute the random values in that you know, low abundance range? Uh, there is a formula in Excel that is called RAND, where when you write it like this, like with nothing in between, it's just creating a random value between zero and one. So <clears throat> uh, basically, you know, Excel just, you know, generates random values for you. And this is, this could be, uh, you know, this could be a very good uh, way to, um, you know, to impute values. Now, the problem is that between zero and one is a very wide distribution, right? That includes also proteins that are actually not that low abundant, right? If you have a value that is, you know, plus one, so if you want to give to this random distribution of data a more narrow uh, distribution, then you can just multiply this rand value by you know, a small number. For example, 0 0.3. 0 0.3 is going to be, uh, you know, if you multiply a random formula times 0 0.3, you're gonna get imputed values not between zero and one, but between zero and 0 0.3. Uh, and that is going to be more like uh, you know, the variability that you expect from a, from a proteomic data set. And of course, if the value is false, then you just have, you know, you just can put back, you know, the original value. So you only do this for cells that are blank. And let me show you an example. Right. So now that we have imputed missing values, uh, there shouldn't be any cell that doesn't contain any value. If we plot this again as a violin plot, you see that now you see the distribution has moved a little bit lower. And that's because there were missing values in this distribution that now contribute to form, you know, the, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the now are part of the data distribution. So uh, the good thing is that now we don't have any missing value anymore. And now whenever you had missing values, they're being replaced with values that represent background noise. You see that these are missing values that are between minus four and minus five, you know, something like that. And in fact, minus four and minus five is this area of your valid value. So we imputed missing values in the range where you have your limit of detection. So now you have a table that doesn't have any missing values anymore is ready for calculating fault change and statistics and plot, for example, a volcano plot. You know, volcano plot is the most, uh, uh, is one of the favorite 
uh, graphs of uh, proteomic people, including myself, because it's a simple graph that includes a lot of information. I'm going to tell you in a second. So let's say that we want to direct, oh, we want to directly plot uh, a volcano plot. And a volcano plot is a two dimensional scatter plot that has on the x-axis the whole chain that tells you how much a protein is enriched in one sample compared to another and the y-axis can include the p-value tells you how consistent this observation is so now let's say that we want to plot the x-axis the x-axis let's say we want the numerator rmd and the denominator the y-type and basically now is just an average of these replicates for the numerator minus the average of these replicates for the denominator, right? And uh, <clears throat> remember that in reality, what we're doing, we are dividing, but we are working with the log transform data. So that's why we subtract these values instead of dividing them. So this column here now is going to represent your uh, whole chain. So for example, this specific protein is enriched in RMD compared to white type. Proteins that have negative values, uh, they are enriched instead in the, uh, in the white type. This one is going to be not significant because you see the values are very variable, but that's exactly why we need an additional dimension to our graph, which is the, the p value. Now, and this one is probably a question that you all have been wondering, uh, you know, what kind of statistical test do I do when I have these data? I don't know anything about the relationship of my samples and you know, maybe some of you are also not a big fan of statistics. Uh, now, the thing is <clears throat> uh, in this uh, publication, uh, we try to give some indications about uh, what kind of statistic test you can do when you compare uh, two samples with each other. Uh, when you have only three replicates, honestly, you don't really have a lot of choices uh, because, um, and, you know, even though the t-test uh, is specific for parametric statistics, so for data that are normally distributed, is kind of is one of the very very few that works efficiently when you have, you know, data, you know, so few number of replicates. When you have several replicates then you can assess whether your distribution of your replicate is normal or not normal. When you have only three replicates, it's very hard to tell. And by the way, three is not just a random number. Uh, three uh, is basically is a number that comes up a lot in, um, you know, in proteomics because it's the minimum number of replicates that you need to estimate the standard deviation. So uh, with less than two replicates, with only two data points, you cannot tell where your data are centered. When you have at least three replicates, you can tell my data are centered in, you know, in a certain, uh, you know, they have a certain distribution. Uh, obviously, the more replicates you have, the more accurate the estimation of your data distribution is. Uh, but, you know, when you have only three replicates, you don't have a lot of choices. However, <clears throat> when you do this in Excel, uh, Excel reminds you that there are multiple type of t-tests. So let's say that we write simply the formula t-test, right? So the first two things that he's asking you is asking, give me the array one and the array two. So these are the two uh, sets of samples. This is the array one. This is the array two. And then he's asking you the number of tails, right? So the, the tails basically simply mean how stringent you want your test to be, right? So two tail, a two-tailed test um, is more stringent, uh, so uh, we don't have time to discuss about exactly what it means. But you know, by default, we use the uh, stringent test, you know, the two-tailed distribution. And then uh, this is what I wanted to spend um, one more minute with you, which is what type of t-test uh, you're going to use, you know, to tell are these two samples different. Now the question comes uh, whether these two samples are paired for some reason, so the, the replicates are coupled by something, some relationship, or they are independent samples. And if there are two independent samples, you can either have equal variance or unequal variance. So they're called homoshedastic or heteroshedastic. So whether you type one, two, or three, you are actually using three different types of p-test, so it's important to know the difference. So what's the difference between them? Paired test basically means that your data, uh, your replicates have some sort of relationship. For example, you, you have three mice, and then you want to study the glucose content in the blood of this mouse before or after giving them the cookie, right? 
Uh, if you give cookies to these three mice and you take their blood before and after feeding them, uh, these observations, they are related to each other because it's the same mouse before and after the cookie. So even though the le basal level of the glucose could be different between the mice, what really matters is, is the glucose con the content consistently going up as you give them the cookie. So in that case, you know, you're talking about a pair detect, uh, and that's why you need to actually tell the software that your data is some sort of relationship. If not, if they are three samples uh, in the, that are independent, then we're talking about independent tests, and then you have to choose between you know, the type two and the type three. The type two means homoshedastic, and the type three means heteroshedastic. Homoshedastic means that your two samples whether they are, you know, uh, whether they are significantly different or not, uh, they have uh, replicates that have the same variability. Basically, the the, um, the the error bar of your two conditions is not that different between one sample and, and the other, even though they don't overlap. Uh, type three heteroshedastic means that you actually have two sets of samples, one of which is very variable, the other one that is very little variable. And then in that case, the t-test needs to calculate the variability of these two samples independently. So the type 3 uh, becomes a little bit more different, difficult to make significant, but is more appropriate if you have data distributed like this. Uh, how do you do that? How do you tell if they are distributed like this or not? Uh, you can do it with uh, F-test. F-test is simply a test in Excel. Uh, you take the two groups like this, and if it turns out to be significant, it means that your two sets of numbers, they have a very different uh, distribution. You see, for example, this one is very significant because it has a p-value that is very, very little. And in fact, you see that your RMD samples, they have a very low variability. And instead, the white type samples, they have a very high variability. So this is a protein for which you need a type three test. You don't need a type two, right? So the question is, you know, how do you use uh, the right test for each protein? You know, again, same thing here. You can use a logical formula. Uh, you can say that if this value is significant, so the significance threshold is usually set at 0, 0, 005. Um, so then you use the heteroshedastic t test. So use the t test where you have the two arrays, two tails, type three. If instead the F test is not significant, then you can use the classical T test, uh, the one that is homoshedastic, that assumes that your two data, they have basically the same variability, whether they overlap or not. So <clears throat> what you have in the, is there a question? Oh, sorry, I thought I heard something. Sorry about that. And here you have now your full change and your p-value. Now, uh, in order to plot this as a volcano plot, you know, the p-value is, you know, is better if it's very small, right? So if you actually take these two columns now and you plot them as a volcano plot, it's gonna look like this. It's gonna look very weird, uh, where your x-axis representative of your fold change, but the y-axis, you know, the interesting proteins are those, you know, the ones that have a very, very low uh, p-value. Right, uh, and you know, obviously, you've never seen a volcano plot like this because it's very hard to to read. Uh, so, in order to actually display the p-value, uh, you know, to have the very significant proteins at the top of your volcano, we just take all of this formula and we convert it uh, and we transform it in minus log two. So, the minus log two of the p-value or log ten, whatever base you you like, actually. Uh, this is the one that shows you, um, you know, which proteins are, you know, the most significantly regulated. And now this is a volcano that you recognize a little more. Uh, and as you can see now, it's immediately clear where the interesting proteins are. You know, these are proteins that have a very strong full change and p value uh, in your RMD samples. These are the ones that have a very strong uh, full change and p value in the white type sample. Now, the very last thing. Then uh, I'm out of time. Uh, how do you 
you know, once you are done, uh, how do you organize your table to see, okay, where are my interesting proteins? You know, I want to have uh, my most regulated proteins at the very top of the table, so it's easier for me to, uh, to look at them. Well, you know, there's not one way of doing it. Uh, I can tell you what is my way that I hope is useful. So uh, to show you that, let me just put uh, some color coding that makes it a little bit easier for you to see what are the things that are most regulated. Right, so I colored in uh, uh, red and blue, uh, positive and negative for changes, and I colored in green uh, the strongest uh, p-values. So the more green, the more uh, significant is uh, your protein. So uh, what I, the way I like to organize my table, I, I like to organize them with uh, you know, a totally arbitrary score, uh, where basically I take the product between uh, the whole change and the p-value. So the bigger is this number, and the more uh, you have a very high values, both in the full change and the p-value. So if now you sort your table by the score, you're going to have at the top of the table the proteins that are the most uh, enriched in terms of both full change and p-value. There you go. So. These are the proteins that have a very strong uh, enrichment, significant enrichment in your R&D condition. So now your table is much easier to read because you just go back here and you tell, okay, these are the um, these are the proteins that are the most enriched for me. And you know, it's not a coincidence that some of the most enriched are proteins that were totally undetectable in the white side, and they have a very high value in this treated sample. Now, spoiler alert, this was, uh, uh, these were T-cells uh, where we wanted to reactivate uh, HIV. And you see that now you have the HIV proteins that are the most enriched in your RMD sample. And so I think I'll, I'll stop here uh, because now what you have, you have a table that is organized for proteins that are most enriched in the RMD sample at the top of your table, most enriched in your control sample at the bottom of the table, so now it's a table that you can read. It's a table that, you know, as you go through it, you can really tell, okay, these are the proteins that are the most significant in my RMD sample. Uh, what we're going to do next week, uh, we're going to discuss, now that we have the table organized like this, how do I convert this table into a network, into meaningful biology, into functional enrichment? So what we're going to do next week, we're going to select uh, these accession numbers or these gene names, and then put them into uh, into one of these uh, publicly accessible uh, free software, and uh, show you how uh, you convert an Excel table into uh, into a network, into something that is digestible and ready for publication. So <clears throat> I'm going to stop here. Thank you, Andrea. Thanks, Simone. Really, really interesting, and I would also say. Pretty straightforward and easy to follow. Um, uh, yeah, uh, Marinke is commenting that the tips were really brilliant. Uh, any question from the audience? I'm also trying to read the chat. Oh, yeah, yeah. One question. Yeah, so yeah, can, can, can I just say something to, to not have any political problem? You know, obviously, this is not the only way, you know, to, to process proteomic data. You will find in the literature things that are much more sophisticated and um, I really wanted to present it this way you know to to give an opportunity for everyone who doesn't know how to code who doesn't know how to launch script how to organize their proteomic table you know this is just full disclosure so thank you sorry for the interruption no problem Pietro please go ahead yeah, so the first of all I will never speak badly again of Excel <laughs> 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 no the question was about normalization so uh, this is I mean, it's similar. What you do is similar to what what in blue metabolomics is TIC normalization. So, uh, basically, saying that the average intensity of the the proteins in your sample is the same. Uh, is this a choice? So this, this uh, from my experience, this is a choice that works well if you don't have huge differences between the two classes. Yeah. Otherwise, you have to find probably something more uh, sophisticated to avoid having that the normalization is creating additional biomarkers for free. Can you comment on this? Because I think yeah. it's important. 
it is very important. And, uh, you know, again, I knew that, you know, oversimplifying things was going to get me into trouble, but, uh, uh, <clears throat> but you're totally right. You know, the, the thing about normalization is that there are many, many ways of doing it. And, and some people don't normalize, don't normalize by, you know, the center of, of data distribution, they use other approaches. And, you know, the, the principle of doing it the way I explain it um, is based on the fact that you start from samples that should have, you know, regulated proteins, but proteins that have, you know, similar injection amount. You know, so if you have similar injection amount, then basically the area or, you know, the, the, the distribution of your data should align somehow, right? Because um, even though proteins are different, the total protein content is the same. And it's true that it's not always like this. And some people, for example, prefer to normalize by uh, spiking standards, or they prefer to normalize by, you know, their favorite protein that is not supposed to change uh, into, you know, into your entire table. And the risk I see in doing that for proteomics, you know, I cannot speak for metabolomics, but the risk I see that doing, doing it for proteomics is that when you normalize by very few data points, uh, the probability of error is actually higher. You know, and we know that, you know, instruments, they have their biases. We know that the instruments don't have always the same exact quantification. So the fewer data points you use, and the more you risk to actually skew your, you know, data distributions, <clears throat> and then, you know, normalization is actually harming your data alignment rather than helping it. Uh, so the way I explain it uh, is, is suitable if, let's say, you, you, your uh, experimental design assumes that you injected one microgram per injection, right? So if, if you do other type of injections, then, of course, this is not the ideal way of doing it. I don't know if that answers your question. No, yes, yes. In, mm -hmm. Indeed, uh, well, well, probably, since I agree with this idea that using internal standard or no things it can be tricky. So now, one thing one can, can do, but obviously this is more tricky to do in Excel, is to do this uh, probabilistic portion normalization. So basically you, you calculate the distribution of the normalization factors for all the proteins, and then you take the median of that distribution as a normalizing factor of the center. Yeah, you can do it by quantile normalization. But this well, obviously, I, uh, I, I mean, I don't think, I think there is nothing bad in doing it as you do, if the conditions are the ones. So people should use the easy thing when they know. So if you are comparing, let's say, I don't know, the, I'm back to metabolomics, the metabolome of a plant and the metabolome of a, a, a monkey, I would not use this. Because they, course, the system is very different. But if the system are reasonably comparable, there is nothing bad, I think, in doing what you do. Yeah, also yeah. because, uh, let's say, uh, if you're comparing the metabolome of a plant with the metabolome of, uh, of a monkey, then you're, you don't have only the issue of injecting the same amount of material. You also have the issue that data can have different distributions. So obviously, uh, what I explained uh, is, is only suitable if data have the same distribution. And uh, after you adjust by the average, basically, you have distribution that, you know, mostly align. Um, if you if you plot your uh, your violin plot and you see that actually your violin has you know, multiple bumps, uh, this clearly means that, for example, your data are not normally distributed, or uh, or maybe they have different width. Uh, this means that your data have different uh, dynamic ranges. So there is a larger difference between your least abundant metabolite and your most abundant metabolite. Then, of course, what I explained is not applicable. You need to use more sophisticated normalization. Absolutely. But uh, you know, if you if you take you know if you do it the way I do it, you plot your data as a violin plot. You see that the violins they are similar to each other. Uh, then you can proceed. And uh, if they are very different from each other, these violins, you know, rather than going crazy with data normalization, if your samples were supposed to be similar, then I would use this as a red flag. You know, to maybe something went wrong with your experiment. Uh, that's why it's very useful to plot data at every step of the data processing. Thanks, very, very interesting. Any, any further question from for uh, Simone? If 
Not actually, I, I do have a, a question. Um, uh, at the beginning, I mean, the first uh, six columns of your Excel files, now if I remember right, um, were kind of big areas or something like that, as if the, the experiment was a label-free experiment or whatever. Uh, now I'm wondering how do how would you deal with uh, uh, TMT or ITRAC based protein quantification where you've got a ratio between uh, say treated and controlled? That's right. That's a good question as well. So <clears throat> the um, um, you know the, the the table that you saw the row table is uh, that specifically was the output of a, of a specific software. If you use a different software, you know, the output is going to look aesthetically a little different, but the substance is the is the same. If you are working with a, a labeling experiment, then uh, the row intensity of your protein becomes less meaningful. What you are really interested into is what is the relative change between um, uh, sample A and sample B. So software, they tend to output data directly as a ratio. If not, of course, you can calculate it manually. And the thing about <clears throat> when you have ratio values, um, and most of the steps are actually identical because um, ultimately, if you have uh, a mixture of conditions, let's say with TMT labeling, uh, you, you know, unless you have a specific reason for not doing that, you try to mix your samples in equal amount, which means that after you log transform your ratios, you are supposed to have the ratios centered around zero. You know, uh, you know, around one if you have uh, absolute values, around zero if you have log transform values, right? Because it means that overall your uh, proteins are not changing. You know, there is a specific protein going up, specific protein going down, but the overall distribution is distributed <laughs> around zero. Now everything is the same. <clears throat> Uh, and when you impute missing values, instead of using the minimum of the distribution, you tend to use the center of the distribution because uh, you know if a protein is undetectable, uh, you usually impute it as a you usually give it a negative uh, attribute. You know this protein is not really changing. You know if it's not if you cannot calculate the ratio. And when you are at the statistics part, uh, that gets a little tricky because you don't have any more condition A versus condition B. But uh, you know that you want your ratio to be different than no change. So you can actually use exactly the same, um, uh, the same formulas, but instead of comparing array one with array two, your array one is your list of ratios and your array two is zero, right? So your protein is interesting if it's significantly different from zero, you know, when data log transforms. So you can use, a, you know, maybe not the ideal method, but you can use exactly the same procedure. And then at the time of the statistic calculation, what you want, you want your set of ratios to be statistically different from zero. Okay. I see a couple of questions in the chat from Sarah, but I think Marinka is trying to answer. I've just moved from targeted analysis to un untargeted. And there's a comment here, of course. Can this method also be used for metabolomics based on um, Marinka's opinion is yes. What is yours? Yes, yes, and I agree. And also, you know, full disclosure, I'm not the, the metabolomic expert, so I'm not the ideal person to answer that question. Uh, but yeah, you know, the, if I may add a comment, uh, you know, the, the, the thing about metabolomics, you know, it's a very exciting field and is more, uh, it's younger than proteomics. And also it has the extra problem that in a way, identifying proteins is much easier than identifying metabolites because we have peptides that fragment in a specific way, you know, metabolites are, you know, much more diverse and, and, and trickier. So uh, I think a part of the reason that you have also more uh, troubles is that in, in, in a metabolomic table, um, especially if you do untargeted, there is a much longer list of signals that are not fully characterized. Uh, and that's what makes it you know, more complicated to, to deconvolute data. Uh, in proteomics, you know, if a protein does not pass a certain you know, significance, confidence, you know, it, it doesn't show up in your table. Uh, it doesn't mean that everything is perfect, but uh, you know, in a way, 
it's easier to tell, okay, this is the list of my proteins. Uh, and that's probably the reason why you're having this problem uh, rather than the normalization. Uh, but again, I'm not a metabolomic expert, so maybe it's not the, I'm not the right person to answer this question. May I may I also add a little comment to these metabolomics ah, topics? So I think I mean like of, of course it is actually the the uh, this um, super brilliant tips that Simone showed us today is really great to have like general overview on how your data is going, and and if if the PQN normalization can be done in Excel, I think I will finally and uh, uh, definitely uh, leave R and move to Excel. Sorry, Pietro. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But it, uh, definitely it can be done like this, and uh, and I think it's really very nice to especially to people that are starting like the adventure with the omics in general so i think and it was really brilliant i i now i'm only waiting that this video will be on the on the youtube so just to try and to repeat all the steps you know i, I really super appreciate this 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 video this tutorial uh really great job so congratulations and um yeah this i do agree like yeah in metabolomics usually the list of features is much longer and and it's a little bit more difficult to get some uh, rid of it and and get some um, good annotation which is the other story other side of the metabolomics in in the proteomics it goes a little easier um so i'm i'm looking for the second video of yours and the second meeting of the IMAS. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Thank you. That's very kind of you. And, and again, <clears throat> uh, absolutely, I'm totally aware that with uh, with R scripts and other sophisticated software, you can do much more sophisticated data processing. Uh, but Marika really hit to the point of the aim of my presentation today. You know, I just wanted to give you a feeling about. Uh, what is going on when uh, when uh, data are being transformed? Uh, absolutely, there are better ways of doing this. Uh, I just uh, advise against launching scripts without knowing what these scripts do. You know, that, that's my only advice. But uh, absolutely, you know, no doubt that R can do more sophisticated things. Okay. If I think we can close the meeting now. It's one hour, so I think it's time to and the meeting stay tuned for the next uh, meeting that is scheduled for next uh, monday if i remember right yeah uh, next monday we'll talk about uh, something more uh, uh, you know independently how you transform your data uh, next week we're going to talk about uh, how you uh, give it some biological meaning good I'm looking forward to it thank you very much simone thank you thanks everybody for joining this seminar See you soon and stay tuned for further IMAS initiatives.